We continue the story of the Porsche 911 GT3, this time with the 991.1 and .2 generation. We discuss how the car was created and how it evolved. My name is Andreas Breuninger and I'm the director of the GT Cars in Porsche Development Center in Weissach. Most of the people entering a GT3, uh, you could describe the situation, um, normally your pulse quickens, your heart starts racing before you turn the key. And um, this is uh, what uh, many, many customers tell me all the time. It's, uh, for, for them, it's, uh, it's an experience they're looking forward to. It's an experience uh, that they use for as a, their own reward after a hard day of working or at the weekend when you just go driving for the sake of driving. The last thing, at least that goes for me, um, when you get out of the car after a good drive, I mostly turn around just to look at it again. And, uh, Sometimes I even pat it on the roof a little bit. Inside the 991 generation GT3s, and before we head into the shop to walk you through the technical differences between the dot one and dot two iterations of this vehicle, I thought it was important to show you what these cabins are like to live with and the subtle differences between the two generations. Both the dot one and the dot two have largely the same cabin, and that's because they're both based on the 991 generation 911. So what does that leave you with? Well, it means you have one of the more practical dedicated sports car cabins. You have great frontward visibility, good headroom, and clever storage solutions found throughout this vehicle. You have a good sized front trunk, good in-car storage solutions like the door cards or the rear storage space behind the front seats. Speaking of seats, in both generations of GT3, you have two seat options, either a bucket seat like these carbon buckets, which may look uncomfortable, but they are actually very, very good on longer drives. However, ingress and egress is a little difficult, or you have a more regular, let's call it touring seat, which is, which is electronically adjustable. The key differences between these cars is some of the updates in interior design language, like the steering wheel change. The Dot 1 has a much bigger wheel than the Dot 2. Some of the design material changes found throughout the cabin and the updates to infotainment. Not surprisingly, the Dot 2 has a much more modern infotainment system with things like Apple CarPlay, not to mention the fact that the screens found in both the gauge cluster and the infotainment system itself have been vastly improved. The inputs in this car are all physical, and this is something that Porsche has gone away from. They've started to hybridize the control structure and added physical and touch. This is not the case in this generation 911. Everything you interact with, whether it be your drive modes, HVAC controls, or infotainment controls, all have a physical switch associated with them. The last thing I want to talk about before we head into the shop are the inputs. Everything in both of these cars feels spectacular, whether that be the steering wheel itself, the shifter, this is one of the best manual shifters I've ever used. However, the PDK has a nice physicality behind it and pedal box are textbook perfect. So with that said, let's head into the shop. Doing an unpaid retrospective on a previous generation GT3 car that is no longer sold new required some collaboration. First, we worked with Porsche North America and Germany. Gentlemen like Luke and Frank helped us to get the interviews with the creators of this car. Then we worked with Motorworks of Barrington, our local Porsche dealership, who's sold many new Porsche products to our viewers. They helped get the 991.1 and .2 on the lift to take them apart to show us how these cars were assembled so we can then explain all the technical information to you. Then our viewers like Elvis and Chris who supplied their 991.2s for a street and a track drive. And it's all these moving pieces that really is a community effort that now allows us to break down the mechanical attributes of this car, starting with the suspension. 
So let's talk about what they did to suspension, Mark, before we get into the aerodynamics. At least in the front, this is a strut front suspension. They have an interesting hybrid lower control arm with two individual links to the lower knuckle. The knuckle itself is all aluminum, and you have a Bilstein damper with Bilstein springs that are height adjustable and adaptive. And the body of this car from the previous generation was also wider in the back. So there's certain things that they did here suspension wise from a regular Carrera to make it more track focused. All of the suspension is GT specific, GT3 specific front strut and rear multi-link. And that is because they planned on this dealing with much higher loads and G-forces and then just a regular street car that was going to be putted around on the weekend. So the arrow on the GT3 is unique. It gets changed as this car got progressed in the Dot 2. But in the Dot 1, you have a unique front and rear fascia when compared to the regular Carrera and a ginormous rear wing. The arrow on this car is genuinely real and it Functional. produces, yeah, yeah, it produces several hundred pounds of downforce. And as you go up the rings to like the GT3 RS and the higher levels, you get to lean more on the aerodynamics at higher speeds. And that's something you notice with these cars that you don't with like lower end sports cars. And this is all designed in a wind tunnel. And this is part of what makes this car special from their motorsports experience. They get to share some of those resources. So when you see airflow, not just the outside stuff that you see, like the, the splitters and the, the wing, it's the underbody that you don't see, how air is channeled. Simple things like these spats and these air guides that funnel air from this part of the car into the braking system without having to use dedicated ducts that you'd see on a race car. It's the vent work and the wheel wells and the wheel wells in the back that help to increase or reduce pressure to reduce the lift effect all of this is working together and you know it's something you don't appreciate until you really start to look at every corner of it yeah and again mark all the changes were done to this car really the 991 generation was about broadening the bandwidth of available buyer for the gt car they wanted it to appeal to a wider variety of buyers as a byproduct of that it was the best selling generation of gt3 they'd ever done so let's talk about brakes so you have two brake options on this car, Mark. You have a steel rotor, which is 380 millimeters, or a carbon ceramic, or what they call PCCBs, Porsche carbon ceramic brakes, that are even larger. I will say this, both the steels and carbon ceramic rotors are very, very effective, but the carbon ceramics are extraordinarily expensive to replace, but they do have a far higher thermal capacity and they do not dust which is a great time to get into another consumable aspect, Jack. Yes, the wheel bearings on this car, because this vehicle has unique front, basically spindles, you have a center locking lug on this car. Porsche have used it as a consumable, specifically on track use. And essentially everything that has to do with the wheel bearing gets replaced in like, I think it's like 6,000 miles on track. And from my understanding, it's like $12,000 to do this service. And it's more than just the wheel bearings, but it is, extraordinarily expensive but again this was an expensive car to begin with yeah and i think we keep reusing that phrase and i i just want to put this out there that you're looking at a car that is highly capable and as you go up the performance ranks ranks whether it's exotic cars or whatever performance has a dollar amount attached to it and higher performance parts require more service and more maintenance that's just the reality of it i don't care what car you're dealing with so when we say this keep that in mind if you're going to drive this on track like it was designed to be done, your maintenance schedule goes up and up, and so do the costs, and it's not unique just to the GT3. Yeah, Porsche has built the service intervals around cars that are tracked or cars that are just street-driven. The last thing I want to talk about on the front, though, Mark, is the EPS. Again, a controversial thing. They want to electric power steering. However, the electric power steering was unique to the GT3. If you talk to someone like Andreas Pruttinger, one of their lead engineers, he claims that the tuning they did to the 991's steering rack for the GT3 was as every bit as good as the car it replaced, which was a hydraulic unit. And honestly, as time has progressed, it's pretty impressive. For, for its yeah. generation, it's good. And again, the other part about this conversation with a car like this is what does it feel like on the street and what does it feel like on the limit? And they're two separate things. Yes. And we're gonna address that more as we get into this video. But let's talk about the 991.2 jack and the changes that were made. 
So it's time to talk about the front of the 991.2. The .2 replaced the .1, and there were some special things that came with that car, like an all-new engine, the reintroduction of a manual transmission, new front and rear fascias, and new aerodynamics. So the front and rear arrow of this car was entirely changed, plus some unique tidbits to the underneath of this car, like these veins, the rear diffuser, the rear wing was taller and collected cleaner air than the other car, and produced more downforce. 20% more downforce with no penalty in coefficient of drag, which is extremely impressive. Yeah, and that's because they have a wind tunnel at their disposal and some of the best people working on it. The front fascia mark is bigger as well, so for the extra cooling for the coolers. And the rear bumper is entirely different because they went to new bumper material. They have a padded variant of polyurethane, so the rear bumper is stronger than the prior bumper and it is 20% lighter. The front suspension though, Mark, I'm gonna be pretty honest, looks to the untrained eye essentially the same. You still have a threaded shock body from Bilstein, you still have strut suspension, and you still have aluminum everything. Though one of their goals for this car was to reduce internal resistance of various components. So as a byproduct of that, the dampers themselves are tuned to be a little bit more compliant. And they've been revalved and they've reduced the steel section inside of them. So again, engine, suspension, bushings, all the subtle things that they need to do and want to do to improve everything is the name of the game with a car like this. Yeah, and the EPS, from my understanding, was also retuned to feel even more natural. And the calipers on these Brembo brakes were also retuned as well. Or the overhauled, yeah, the yeah. internal structure. The piston size was changed from, the piston size, or the piston number stayed the same, but the piston size was changed. From, from, from the dot one to the dot two. Which can affect brake pedal feel and confidence in braking, and uh, all the science behind all of that. And the tire compound was also unique to the dot two. The Pilot Sport Cup 2 was the latest variant of Michelin's famous sticky tire, and that was found on this 911. So those subtleties increased or improved ride quality, improved downforce, improved all the drivability aspects. And I think now is a good time, Jack, to head to the back and we'll talk about some of the generational changes there. All right. So Mark, we made it to the rear of the GT3s. I'm gonna walk you through the subtle differences between dot one and the dot two. In both cases, you have aluminum rear subframes, which appear to be identical. And you have all aluminum suspension components. Both cars have threaded rear shocks, which means they're height adjustable, and they both are still active. And they both have rear steer. However, the rear steer was reprogrammed to be more natural in the Dot 2. The reason they added rear steer to this car in the 991 generation was the first generation of GT3 to have active rear steering, is it effectively either shortens or lengthens the wheelbase of the vehicle to increase turn-in agility or increase the feeling of high-speed stability. So at lower speeds, the wheels will turn in the opposite direction of how you're turning the vehicle, and at higher speeds, they will turn with the car to functionally lengthen the wheelbase to add more high-speed stability. The car rides a lot better. The Dot 2 seems to have far better body control and ride control than the Dot 1. And to me, at least, the front and the rear of the Dot 2 feel better connected. It has a far more natural feeling driving dynamic. It still is a rear, en rear engine car. It still has some of that Porsche 911 yeah. strangeness, but to me, it feels far more organic. So let's talk about the real nuts and bolts of this car, and that are the two different engines you could get. And transmissions. Oh, excuse me. Engines and transmissions. When we brought out the 991 first gen GT3, we could only afford in this huge development project uh, to uh, develop one gearbox. And we wanted to develop the gearbox that is uh, most competent on track and uh, gives us the best track times because uh, the car is coming from Porsche Motorsport and uh, we, have to, we have to be on pole position. That was at least uh, what we expected from ourselves. Um, but we knew that we couldn't, we, we couldn't really um, yeah, get the old school driving customers into the car because they were used to uh, the manual shift operation and uh, it's very popular on GT cars to, yeah, to operate the gears yourself. We knew that and uh, we found out uh, with the GT4 and the 911R uh, that there's a huge market on the, on, the, on the aficionado side, the car aficionado side for manuals. So we decided to bring it back on the second generation GT3 and uh, offer a choice because uh, life is always good when you have choices. 
Um, in that case, it's not an easy choice because um, both gearboxes are really great. Um, we find that more touring customers um, um, opt for the manual transmission, especially in the US. So we have take rates there. I couldn't believe myself, uh, more than 50%. And um, that shows us clearly that the uh, enthusiast car market is, is, is so much alive. And uh, we're really happy uh, to be able to offer both variants. And um, I have trouble myself sometimes to choose a PDK or a manual depending on the mood and depending what I'm going to do, do with the car. And it's, uh, it's great we have both. The main change between the 991 and the 992 generation, or 991.1 and DOT 2, is the complete engine change. Yeah, they're basically an entirely different car in some ways because they went from a 3.8 liter to a 4 liter. So let me quickly talk about the 3.8. So the 3.8 went away from the famous Metzger engine, which found its roots in the late 90s out of a race car. They went to the 3.8 as their first DFI engine, which is a big deal. And it was no longer built on its own separate assembly line. It was built on the same line that the regular Carrera engine was built on. However, there were some very key differences. They went to hydraulic solid lifters. The type of lifters for the valves that you'd find like in a motorcycle, which helped this thing rev to 9,000 RPM. It made 475 horsepower as well, which is extremely impressive. It had forged internals, a dry sump system, and various other components that gave it its ability to rev so freely. A lot of it is did not have all of the internal friction and losses that a more regular engine would have. Like everything else in this car, reducing all the friction points, reducing steel sections, and increasing revability. That's the whole point of the GT3. Yes. However, there were some issues <laughs> with this engine. Uh, in the very beginning, they had engine fires, they had issues with the hydraulic lifters damaging the camshafts, but Porsche did put a stop sale in place. They extended the warranty of the engine to 10 years or 120,000 miles, and several parts in the engine were updated as the life cycle progressed. And they did recall the original 700 and some odd engines or cars to replace engines. And this was something that was very important to Porsche to make sure that these GT customers were taken care of. Their whole mantra or mentality of this car is durability and unlimited punishment. So they, they did update the motor, they figured out what was going on and they did replace any engine, pretty much no questions asked. And the Don one also made it to a E-diff in the rear with Porsche torque vectoring, which we've talked about in other videos, but essentially what Porsche torque vectoring allows them is to split the torque from the left and right wheel, depending on conditions when you're exiting or entering a corner. So why is it that the six-speed manual does not get the ELSD jack? So when they moved to the DOT2, and that, again, this is a whole new engine, they borrowed the manual out of the 911R which doesn't really surprise me. Why would they develop a gearbox for a single low production car that they only built 991 right, of? Yeah. So they brought it over to the DOT2, and the reason why the manual could not get the E-diff is with the PDK car, the E-diff and the PDK are integrated. The manual lacks the oil pumps that the PDK has to feed, power, and control the electronic differential. They paired the manual gearbox to a mechanical LSD. However, the values of locking and unlocking are different than the PDK. The PDK can lock up to 100%, where the mechanical diff has fixed values of 30% in traction and 37% on overrun. The other difference in the gearbox from the 911R was they went to a dual mass flywheel, and that's because the resident frequency of the flywheel did not pair well to the engine. The engine though, Mark, and that's really the sweet spot about the 991.2, was a all new engine, and it was the four liter. While it was somewhat similar to the GT3 RS 4-liter found in the DOT1, most of the internals were different, and the way they went about the oiling system was different, and they went to solid non-hydraulic lifters to reduce some of the reliability issues from the DOT1. So it's also a true motorsports engine. This motor is largely similar to the motor that was found in the GT3 R and the GT3 Cup car. Yeah, and so a lot of those internal changes, and just like the 991.1, that engine was in the same engine family as the Carrera, and they said almost everything was changed. But the big thing was, to the point one to the point two, was oiling, the dry sump. It had six port direct injectors, which was different from the other cars. You had a crankshaft that had oil flow through it. 
The dry sump system had more paths for oil to flow internally to the engine, oil it for managing G-force and vibration and harshness. And you saw titanium components and right. forged components. It was no longer an engine that really shared anything with the Carrera, unlike the right. 3.8. It, this was its own motorsports engine, and it has this great musical feeling to it, and as a byproduct of all that, it produces even more power because it had less internal friction. Yeah, and I think that was the thing between the point one and the point two. They, they openly said they had a lot to learn and they learned a lot moving to this generation engine. And now that it's been, in retrospect, now that it's been proven, it's been carried over to the, the 992, the new car with some changes like individual throttle bodies and tuning and all that. It's not exactly the same as what you find in the RSR still or the cop car because it's got different ECU, different tuning and all that. But the, the foundation now in the 991.2 is as solid as, it, as you're going to get in a naturally aspirated motor of this type. Yeah, these motors are essentially bomb-proof, and unlike most vehicles with a rigid valve train, for the life of the vehicle or life of the engine, you do not need to do any valve adjustments. And the loose number they gave for the life of the engine was 300,000 kilometers. The Porsche 911 has maintained its unique rear engine architecture, while many other manufacturers have moved to the mid-engine layout. With the dawn and push towards EV technology and the change of weight distribution of those cars or alternate propulsion, one must ask, what is the benefit of having an engine in the back of the car? The GT3 is a car that provides such connection to the driver, all the way from the touch points of when you sit in the car, the position, the way that the seats wrap around you, all the touch points of different materials, Alcantara, leather, carbon fiber, the senses are already exploding before you even drive the car. And once you drive the car, quickly you realize that there's such a response to the feeling of the steering, a connection to the brake pedal and the throttle pedal, very high revving, 9,000 RPM redline, emotional uh, connected to the driver. Um, those are all the sort of descriptors that I love as a driver because there are performance numbers and there is lap time, but there's also still that kid inside of you that wants an emotional car that's just fun to drive and something that you can punish and drive at 100% at a track day all day long. There's no waiting around letting tires cool off or letting the engine cool off. These cars are prepared to be absolutely driven uh, to the limit. But the great thing about 911s is that they're relatively small compared to a lot of their competition. So it's a lot more of that feeling of being able to touch all four walls. Uh, you know the proximity, you have good visibility in the car. And then when you step on the throttle or you step on the brakes, you realize that there's just so much track inspired performance that's put into these cars that there's way more performance uh, through, through the evolution of the GT3 than the driver could ever utilize on American roads. So this is the car that you want to take to the track day and flex your guns against your friends. What is the challenging in, uh, moment in, in designing a, a 911 or especially a GT3? For sure, as we have the rear engine layout, the car is not really big. If we, cons if we look at the layout and everything, we want a roomy and spacey interior. We have meanwhile really huge wheels and you have to bring all these parts, the engine, the gearbox, everything in this relatively small car. When I talk to non-car people or, or youngsters about 911s and I talk about what resonated for me growing up in the 80s, it's the sound of a horizontally opposed engine, the boxer design of these cars and, and the 911 engine specifically gives a very, very unique sound. Uh, another thing you'll see is the silhouette of a 911. The 911 was um, debuted in 1964, and if you look back at the original 911 and then you look at today's 911, you'll see so much connection in the evolution and how this car has really stayed closely connected to its roots. So that's some of the coolest parts of a 911 is just to see all of that evolution in over 60 years, it's still very true to what it was founded on and the driving styles are very similar. And for that, I think that they were so far ahead uh, when they first pushed out 
um, a 356 and then evolved into a 911 that um, they're still using that classic rear engine design. It's very unique and almost unheard of to um, buy a modern car with a rear engine and that's something a 911 um, has always stayed true to its roots. And as a performance driver, it allows you to do things with the car that you couldn't otherwise do with a mid-engine car, which is a lot of the supercars and high-performing cars that you see today, or a front-engine car. Um, specifically, I can load the front of this tire much harder, carry the brake into the corner, which means I can brake very late and extend my brake zone all the way through to the apex of the corner, rotate the car quickly, and then jump on the throttle and now I have that rear weight over the rear axle which gives me added traction. You can see it's wet behind me. 911s are known to go to the front in races when it starts raining and a lot of that is because of the driving dynamics of the initial design and where you put weight. Ultimately when you think about driving high performance it's a steering wheel that tells the car where to go but I would argue that once you get into high performance driving it's really what your feet do that connects to how the car turns and how the car accelerates. So with a steering wheel, you can turn the wheel as much as you want, but if you don't have the weight placed and you don't have the speed right, your hands can't help you. So those are the types of things we talk about when we talk about placement of a car and racing lines. If you can nail weight distribution and weight transfer, you're going to be a safer, quicker, and more responsive driver. If we see for some competitors, they radically change their layout of the car, like our friends from Corvette. Um, their eighth generation comes with a mid-engine car, or mid-engine layout, and as we are all engineers, we fully understand what's the driver behind that, its performance. Now for clear, people ask us, was this considered also for a 911 or for the 992 generation, and especially as we um, have changed the layout um, for our GTE cars that are racing in IMSA, WEC and especially in Le Mans. And a clear answer is no, we did never consider this, as the unique layout of the 911 has still so many advantages performance-wise. If I look at traction, if I look at uh, the ability to use the rear brakes for um, phenomenal um, brake distances we can achieve, and especially the special feeling of the 911, where does the sound come from, the roomy interior you have. All these is so important for the 911 that we will never change the layout with the combustion engine in the rear. one dot two GT3 four liter that roasts a 9,000 rpm three pedals and a manual I know that scares you I'm sorry we're not with a CVT and a 1.5 liter three cylinder but nevertheless I think it's time to show the boys and girls I want to hear it now all right all right all right this long and hard as someone that wants to buy one of these cars I think for me the primary reason why you buy it is the engine there's nothing else there's very few cars that sound like this on the planet and we know that this combination is something that is like the 1% of vehicles made and it gives you such 
an emotional response to hear it, to feel it, to be involved in a car like this that is so purpose built to be amazing like that. And I, I have to own one, but we need to talk about what the real reality of driving this on the street is. This car as a street car is Outside of the engine, its capabilities are entirely wasted. I love this manual gearbox. I love the pedal box, I love the way the shifter feels. I love everything about it. But unless you have roads like we have, or you live on the Autobahn, it's gearing and the fact that you are gonna wanna chase that 9,000 RPM rev limiter all the time, you're gonna go to jail. Yeah. It is so tallly geared that in second gear is, top of second is 77 miles an hour and top of third is well into the triple digits. Yeah. It's a very, I mean, it's a hard car sometimes to drive. You constantly have blue balls. Yeah, no, it's, it, the reality is we drove this and the PDK back to back out here, and I just, I got out of both, and I'm like, if all you're doing is street driving, you almost have to have the PDK, because at least you can go up, down, up, down, up, 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 and you can hear the engine. This, it's basically you live in first and second gear on the street, and that's, that's a real, real problem for me because that means you have to do something downright dangerous or illegal to f just to keep driving this and get any pace in it and I, I think that's where this fails for me as a street car with the manual as much as that's exactly what I would buy as a co the collectible collectible part of it but I don't know what's your feeling on it it's an interesting engine right if you're not someone who likes revving out motors first you're wrong and you should feel wrong but if you want instant gratification this is not gonna be your car. Like here, I'm in third gear, we're at, I'll slow down a little bit. We're at 2,500 RPM, I'm gonna stand on it. Nothing, nothing, nothing. And it starts building. It doesn't start building to like 5,000 RPM. And then the top end, it's just a surge forward. Yeah, and by then you're like, you know, you get rolled by a cop or something jumps out in front of you, there's a high price to pay to have fun on the street with the GT3. And, you know, again, the, the PDK gives you a little bit more enjoyment because th those gears are a lot tighter. It's just, you have that, but you lose that engagement of the manual trans, which you said, this is one of your favorite gearboxes. It's not a gearbox that you have to be particularly gentle with. You can, I'm not saying you can really manhandle it, but you can give it some gusto when you're shifting. The, it has a real mechanical feel to it, and we talk about why in the shop. It doesn't feel like glass. No. You know, you can really get in the groove, and you're not thinking about the mechanical sympathy part of it. This car gives you that sense that you can just really be mean to it. And that's part, that's the freedom of a car like this. And not to mention the fact, too, as a street car, you know, stripping away its capabilities, which a lot of that exists for how good it is on the track, which we're going to take it to here shortly. But as a street car, someone who's a little scared about taking this on the track due to the value and all that other fun stuff. It's still fun and it's very, very capable, but you're never, you're never gonna feel its limits on the street Not unless never. you're maybe in the rain or something. Yeah, you'd have to be in a very specialized place in the world where you have the roads to really explore this. But again, the 1% car like this yeah. it requires the 1% roads <laughs> and condition to enjoy it. I think the last thing to talk about before we get on track is the suspension on the 992, 991.2 yes. in this car. With the, with the changes, this is far more tolerable, and you typically have left the dampers in kind of the non-sport setting, yeah. and it is very good to drive over almost every pavement type. It, it deals with the, like the instant shocks, and it deals with the big floaty, like, you know, when you're, you're lifting, it still has enough damping there for regular driving, and I don't think it's as bad as I expected for a car like this. For how capable this car is, the fact that it rides as well as it does is one of the things that I love so much about this generation of 99. Uh, 911, the 991 generation, the dot twos ride very, very well. There, there isn't this drone in the cabin. It's not super boomy. It's a car you can't. <laughs> this, of course, somehow a fly got in here, Jack. That's oh. because it's your fault, dude. <laughs> so, Mark, <laughs> with that last intelligent thought, I'm gonna wind this out one last time before we get out, get this thing out on the track. Right? Sounds good.
All right, tell me about it, Jack. What do you think? So the first thing I'm gonna notice after spending a decent amount of time in the dot two on the track is the way the front end of this car feels. And there's two reasons for it. First is alignment. You wanna talk about that? Yeah, so the GT3 has, as we talked about in the shop segments, fully capable changes for a camper caster. So when you, you set these things up for the track, you can, you can set it up in a safe way where you get more front end push. And this car is representative of what you get out of the factory. So the front end tends to want to wash out. It will push way before that rear end lets go. So the problem is, is you're constantly fighting the front end. And if you want to build it more speed, you have to do an alignment to dial some of that out. And it's more noticeable on the point one than it is on the point two. The point two front end feels way more stable, less like pokey. Yeah. And you notice it instantly on the street and out here. This, this does not handle and it's not dynamically as, as good at the limit as the point two. I agree, even though this has rear wheel steer and a lot of the work they've done on this generation, the front and the rear feel, I mean, we're, we're pit, you know, we're, we're splitting hairs at this point, but they don't feel as well connected. And also I don't think this car manages its body weight and bad pavement as well as the Dot 2 does. You can get the Dot 2 unsettled a little bit more and because of the rear helper springs and the way they've done the rear suspension in that car, feels far, far more stable. Agreed. So the engine though, Mark, that's the next thing I want to talk about. This 3.8, as we talked about, it's a great length. It has almost nothing to do with the 4 liter that's in the Dot 2, but it's still a very special engine. It revs to 9,000 RPM, it makes really good power, and it has this tremendous, tremendous engine noise. It, but it doesn't have that, the, like the three or four step you know, induction and exhaust note that the Dot 2 has. Do you know what I mean? It yeah, makes... it, it's, it, there's definitely one distinct change with this motor where the Dot 2, you have a couple distinct changes and you have a really significant change at that last thousand RPM that this doesn't have. Still sounds great, but it's different. The and next thing really, Jack, is you do notice the torque difference. You do notice the power difference. There, it's a very slight difference to me. Uh, but the bigger difference, like you were talking about, is the PDK feels way different to you. It's same gearbox, different tuning. Yeah, so it's, it definitely feels a generation older around town when you're just putting around in this thing. It's a lot clunkier. And then out here on the track, when you do leave it in auto PDK Sport, it isn't it doesn't feel as intelligent. It doesn't predict what gear you need to be in anywhere as well. It's still very fast. It still allows you to shift mid-corner like I just did right there without totally upsetting the car. It's, I mean, it's what you want in a dual-clutch gearbox, but it lacks the sharpness that the new car has. Yeah, and it's just, again, when you drive it back to back, you notice this. So, Jack, is it time to get to the point two? I believe it is, Mark. If you're not into this car, then you're not a car person. One more time. Oh my God. <laughs> God, I need a cigarette, Jesus. So, the engine, Mark. Well, it's, it's something. It's a work art, basically. This is, the engine sounds better, as we talked about in the point one. You have that multi-stage like intake sound, and it changes, and it changes progressively, and then it just closes out the symphony at about 8,200 RPMs, where it just sounds, you just want to drive it like this, like a maniac the whole time. 8,200 to 9,000 in this car is almost like a religious experience. If you love internal combustion engines, just listen to that. Absolutely, and I think the other thing is too, is now that I have the PDK here out on track, you realize just how much more focus you have on driving because this car does require a little bit of aptitude to get the most out of it. And you wind up shifting more, which in a way you're not as active because all you're doing is pulling a paddle, but you get to work the gearbox, you get to hear the engine more. So in a way it's better and worse than the uh, manual car. 
It allows you to get into a rhythm with a PDK, and you basically play this engine like an instrument. And forget about the speed for a second. The noise is incredible, but when you're getting objective, how does this feel torque-wise compared to the other engine? It makes more power, for sure. I mean, as you're pulling out of a corner, that's where you notice it. There's that extra torque and smoothness. It just, it feels like a, just an amped up version of the other motor. And doesn't the PDK have that extra amount of sharpness you're expecting? I don't even hear what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> How does the PDK feel compared to the last one? Uh, it just feels more refined. You know, it, it, it's just a more refined gear, like gearbox tuning. It's less harsh outside of a corner, so it upsets the car a little bit less. And, you know, the big thing for me is the front end. It's just a, a market improvement. And then when you go to the track alignment on this thing where you get some camber in the front, you're no longer, you know, the front end doesn't feel nearly as vague as the point one did. And you're fighting the car less and you're working more with the throttle and just, you actually have to do some some work to, to chase this car around and it makes it a lot more fun. So if you're somebody that wants a little bit more edge, at least you have that option here. I much prefer this over the point one. I do too. This is a, I mean, this through the passage of time in engineering, this is a more advanced, better car in basically every objective and even subjective fashion in my mind. The last question I have for you is, how does the front end feel different than the 992? Uh, this just still has that same thing as the point one. There's a little bit less of it. You still feel like the front end doing this. It's got this wobble in it as it's kind of trying to do two things at once, especially in the tight corners. Like, it, it's you don't feel it loading up as much as the 992. And you can't and brake as late. You can't brake as late. You're still having to manage braking more. And then if you get on the throttle too quickly out of the corner, you're like, you start to feel a little bit of push, 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 and then the back end starts to move. So it's just more work to go fast. But at the end of the day, Jack, this is... This one, is one of the great automotive experiences. This is experiences. one of the better cars you're ever going to get into. I don't, I don't care what <laughs> what model you're getting, point one, point two, the new one. If you are even remotely competent behind the wheel, or if you're not, there's something to find and something to appreciate about this car. Yeah, these cars are going away. Internal combustion engines aren't here to stay. Buy one while you can. Trying to categorize a GT3 is no easy task. If you're someone that has driven each generation of this car, you will know that they have their own nuanced personalities, which is partly why they're so sought after and why they hold their value so much. Now, here's the thing. You can make the argument that the older ones were more raw or connected, but as technology improves, as the engineering evolves, things get more refined, and that's the case of the GT3. But one thing's for sure, regardless of which generation you drive, there's one commonality between all of them. And that is the people that have designed these cars, engineered them, raced them, they are looking to connect all of this mechan these mechanical elements, like the transmission, the engine, the feel, the feel of the suspension. So when you get behind the wheel, you feel something emotionally. You feel like you are driving this car as much as you can drive it. And that's something very hard to do, at least in the MSRP of this car, to deliver to the driver. And that's something that a lot of companies do not understand. In this quest to engineer out the driver, in many circumstances, to deliver that high horsepower number, to deliver all that performance on a spec sheet, you forget that sometimes people like to control the car themselves. And the GT3, regardless of generation, have found a way to strike that balance where you don't feel like you're going to die when you drive it, but it also feels like you're doing something with a purpose. And that is the best way I can describe the 911 GT3.